So our next speaker and final one of this session before lunch is Eric Smith. And he's from the Georgia Institute of Technology and the Earth uh, Life Science Institute in Tokyo and also some other institutes, but I'm not going to list all of them. And he is interested in the origin of life and also major evolutionary transitions. And today he will talk to us about the information gateway to life. So whenever the setup is ready, the floor is yours, Eric. So while we're setting up, uh, use this time to thank the organizers very much for the opportunity to be part of the conference. Terrific content, fun, neat group of people. Um, thank you, Charlie, for the connection to the group and also for allowing me to follow you because we know that at least for this brief time, everybody's in a very good mood. <laughs> but now I got to get my head back out of the Charlie verse and remember what it was I meant to tell you guys. So talk today and where is my time? Okay. Talk today is supposed to be about the origin of life. And my point of view will be that life is not one thing. It's an accretion of many things that are different in kind. And the origin of life was not one event. It's a collection of stages. And some of these stages, I want to argue to you, were law-like and predictable from first principles. And those are the things that I'm calling gateways. But to start all of this, let me go back a step and tell you the practical problem that is driving the, the set of questions. I want to know, what do we aspire to in a theory of the origin of life when if we're realistic, our knowledge is overwhelmingly a lack of knowledge, you know, huge gaps. Right now, what we settle for are often scenarios. These are descriptions of imagined histories. And the problem with scenario type reasoning is that it's very fragile when most of the links you would need to connect a chain, you don't have ideas of any quality for, or sometimes, most cases, any ideas at all. So what we want is a way to be able to reason based on the things that we think we have better reason to believe that is robust against the presence of all of these gaps of context. In other words, we would like a science of the origin of life to look more like any other mature systematic science in a field that works. So how can we go about that? Oops, we've frozen out the, the advancer. So, I will tell you while we get the slide to start switching again, um, one answer to this, not meant to be the only possible answer, is that instead of looking for scenarios, we can try to identify sequences of dependence or of directionality. Do we go now? No, still not. Can you try now? I can. Okay, yeah, now we're back. Ahead. Okay, very good. So we can look for dependencies or directionalities that we can derive, even if we don't know what the interval between them was or what the mechanism was for them. And we're looking for those that can be done or about which we can draw conclusions in the absence of much knowledge about mechanism. So let me give you an example of what I mean by this. Um, very well-known example. In 1961, at the first meeting to discuss the possibility for extraterrestrial intelligence, Frank Drake, to try to tame a conversation that he knew could readily get out of hand, tried to break the problem down into a sequence of different contingencies that one could identify even if one could not calculate the likelihood that each one had within the one above it. So, for example, in order to have a civilization, you first have to have stars form, they have to have planets, the planets must be habitable, then they do or don't ever form biospheres. In the biospheres, there is or is not intelligence, it is or is not technological, and then it does or doesn't survive. So the reason the Drake equation works is that behind it, there's a kind of, a, oh no, wrong one. Now I've given away the punchlines. So there's a Venn diagram. And that exists because the final condition is actually a joint condition of all of the previous, which means that the number or the probability of finals can be written as a chain of these conditional probabilities. And even if we don't know what the values are, we gain a lot from understanding the containment relation of the Venn diagram. Now, 
an area where a hierarchy of this kind has been incredibly important to our theory, even as we have had to adjust our understanding of mechanisms, is of course the 20th century theory of the hierarchy of matter. So very early on, and because we have the good fortune to live in a universe with a big bang, advancing time is also advancing cooling. So very early on, you have a quark gluon plasma where you have independent action of symmetry groups on quarks and antiquarks. You cool a little bit, that symmetry is broken so that you now have only joint transformations. And out of that transformation, out, out of that breaking of symmetry, you get heavy baryons and lighter mesons. But at the first temperature, still you're in a plasma of those free particles. If you cool a little bit more, then the exchange of the mesons between the baryons can condense them out and you wind up with nuclei. But of course, you're still in a, an electromagnetic plasma with respect to the electrons that are not confined. You cool a little bit more, that can condense and you form neutral atoms. And then from the atoms, you get molecules and condensed matter and so forth. So this theory exists because of another dependency relation, which is the chain rule for entropy. This is not the same kind of a containment relation as the Drake equation, but it is still a kind of containment relation in state space. So here, I'm not gonna to try to draw the equation for the entire sequence, but between any two stages in this, we have an important relation that to know a full configuration, we need to know its small scale degrees of freedom that are at higher energy and its larger scale degrees of freedom. We need to know how that state space can be populated by the system. But of course, we can always write that population as a conditional entropy of the coarser degrees of freedom in the part of the state space that's occupied plus the entropy of the finer scale degrees of freedom. And it is the presence of phase transitions that cause this entropy to be reduced and the part of the state space that you occupy to collapse into some corner that will then change the conditional entropy for subsequent organization. So in informational terms, phase transitions are two things that we're going to care about. First, they're thresholds and second, they're scaffolds. So each time a phase transition causes you to fall into a corner of the state space and lose the ability to explore in some of the small scale degrees of freedom, the entropy of searching those degrees of freedom is no longer problematic for any subsequent uh, exploration. So there's a, th I, I, I got ahead of myself. First, it's a threshold. For most temperatures, nothing changes about the organization of the system. You hit a particular temperature, you reorganize. That's the, where the phase transition is. After that, nothing else happens for a while. So there's a threshold where either you form order or you don't form it. If you form it, then the entropy that's removed in the uh, high energy scale is no longer affecting the problem of exploration for order at the lower scale, but here's where it's a scaffold. The thing that formed from the first tra phase transition is what we think of or experience phenomenologically as building blocks, and the subsequent organization is limited to the assembly of those building blocks. So this is how we have a sort of an successive elimination of conditional entropy that underlies our whole theory of the hierarchy of matter. So. Do those ideas apply to the living state? And if they do, how do we need to change them in the details from the things we know how to do in high energy physics? Well, first, life is inherently dynamical. It's not just frozen states, but it's frozen processes. That means that the entropy we care about is the continually encroaching sequence of fluctuations. Their ongoing elimination is what we experience as dynamical control. We have a theory of dynamical control now more than half a century developed called control theory. And it allows us to quantify what any controller can or can't achieve. So when we see in the world an attained state of order, that must imply that for every controller that's eliminating the incursion of entropy, the context for the controlled system must have placed it someplace where the controller is actually within its capacity to achieve order. Where we get dependence and directionality is by looking at all the different ways we can assemble contexts and control feedbacks such that there's always an adequate context to place each controller within the domain where it can function. And 
again, phenomenologically, we experience that organization of contexts and controllers such that the contexts provide paths of least resistance, and then the controllers do what it's easiest to do rather than doing something much harder somewhere else. So what would a context or a path of least resistance look like? For now, more than 60 years, as we've come to understand more about the low level building blocks of metabolism, it has been asserted by more and more people in more and more ways that the deep core metabolic reactions of life, which are universal across the biosphere and apparently go back to its beginning, certainly look like something that was prefigured in what it was easiest to do in chemistry. So the content here is, it turns out that everything in the biosphere is synthesized by a pathway that starts from one of 11 molecules, actually one of four or five among these 11. And it happens that there is a pathway that goes through the 11, the 11 that is a metabolic pathway. If we look at where there's variation in the biosphere, we find that there's variation in the ways you can fix carbon. I won't take the time to explain to you this diagrammatic, but the publications explain more. It's just a chemical reaction diagram in a sort of a computer-friendly notation. But of the carbon fixation pathways, they all must, act, they all must be self-amplifying, like uh, Leo Szilard's famous chain reaction. And it turns out that four of the six known pathways, very possibly the only six that exist, are all either part of this same core overlapping with it or tightly linked to it. So it has been proposed that through a combination of their chemistry, their centrality, a variety of remarkable properties of this, these look like paths of least resistance that should have come up in geochemistry and been the easiest thing to do so that when higher levels like molecular control came into existence, they reinforced what was easiest rather than replacing it. That's of course an experimental hypothesis and its testing is still underway. I can, so for a perspective on this that I think treats the most difficult ideas in the most even-handed but also conceptually sophisticated level, which we often don't find, I can refer you to this wonderful review by Kamala Muchowska, Srijit Varma and Joseph Moran. Much of the most exciting work that they report on actually is done by these investigators and their collaborators at University of Strasbourg. And this is one of the plots from their review paper and papers before it in very simple systems that are meant to capture some of what should be going on in early planetary surfaces. They do in fact create multiple carbon molecules that pass through every one of these colored, uh, every one of these drawn molecules is in fact a biomolecule in that low level system that I showed you. And in fact, with very simple catalysts, soluble iron and zinc in certain oxidation states, they even can reproduce segments of the biological pathways as they are used. Now, the organization of this uh, experimental result is not the same as that of biochemistry. And we don't yet understand what it is about the way we're asking the question that causes us to not be able to learn more and ask the, you know, decide this in a better way. But I think it's fair to say at this point that enough good work has been done that it doesn't look crazy to say that a lot of life was not brought into existence in the hierarchy, but rather is prefigured in very simple low level laws that come originally from the periodic table. So, of course, life is not made of complete sentences, it's made of being in a hurry and speaking in shorthand. And so, when these questions are expressed in shorthand, they're often put forth as a kind of an unfortunate dichotomy. A uh, dichotomy between whether metabolism or genes were first in the origin of life. This putative debate, okay, for an approximation, is really about the organization and the capacity of information flows. In the debate, as cartooned, um, the metabolism first point of view is the one I was telling you earlier about conditional entropies. The idea being that the selection of metabolism was done before you have higher order molecular systems. The alternative point of view is one that really takes a kind of a brute Darwinism direct from modern biology and tries to impose it right from the beginning and says control flow from macromolecules is the reason anything exists. An interesting thing which I wanna to get to is that while the two sides have very different approaches to information organization, <clears throat> 
something that they both tend to do, I think more through oversight than anything else, is they tend to conflate the macromolecular world as being folded in physical structure and also coded uh, with a code achieved by selection. That's where I want to say something to you that I think will be new today. Claim that those two should not be conflated, they should be separated. That in fact, there's at least a three level Venn diagram. The metabolism first idea is the one that I already showed you, but we should in fact separate folded from coded matter as categories. So why in a world where people can disagree on many other things, would they make this conflation in this way? I think it comes from the fundamental difficulty of figuring out how to situate the central dogma for control flow that we know from biological evolution in a larger physical theory. So the central dogma was uh, formulated, was articulated by Francis Crick to try to capture the role of genetic and catalytic systems in a Darwinian paradigm for uh, evolution by natural selection. The idea of the dogma is that variation enters when DNA is replicated or in viral life cycles, RNA. There is control flow where everything is a template for everything else, where DNA can make RNA, <clears throat> RNA encodes protein catalysts, which then catalyze the reactions. And the, the molecular substrate, which is organized by the catalyst is then the material out of which all this is made. So the dogma binds all of these steps into an unbreakable ring of just the nastiest chicken egg dependencies, because that's not super complicated but that really is. Now, the discovery in the early 1980s that RNA could be catalytic created a seismic shift in the field and everyone went running in the same direction because they thought, aha, we can get away from the hardest part of this, which is the, <clears throat> the RNA to peptide relation. But they kept one commitment of the central dogma, which was the downward control flow. Variation is introduced a la Darwin in an a priori unbiased fashion. We have to wait until it gets to the expression of phenotype to decide whether it was good or bad, which means we need all of this material to generate phenotype. It is important in this that folding, which actually makes usable structures, has no agency. It presents sequences for selection, but it does not select the sequences within this Darwinian control loop that has been taken from modern life and sort of imposed on early chemistry. The discovery of RNA catalysis may allow us to shorten the loop, but it does not tell us whether it should be broken. So the next question, should we, and if so, can we break this ring at folding? So let me give you two uh, approaches to the answer. This one's just kind of evocative. Think about states of matter, think about condensed matter, solids. Certainly we could make condensed matter by putting every atom in its place with an atomic force microscope that we paid several million dollars to purchase. But do we really think that condensed matter only exists by virtue of the fact that it could be assembled with an AFM? No, other way around. And yet we do think that way about folded proteins, folded RNA, we contextualize them only as consequences of sequences which are produced by a selection model. So do we really mean that or are we just being sort of thoughtless and hurried? But let me give you another argument that I think is better. This one from control theory. Leslie Valiant wrote a wonderful sort of early stage book and a paper leading up to it on what he calls PAC or probably approximately correct learning. Valiant starts with an observation that we all know, which is that selection is the same as Bayesian filtering, which is the same as reinforcement learning. He goes on to say, or to conjecture, that the learnable concepts are a bounded category, kind of like the computable functions are a bounded category. And because selection or reinforcement learning is not a strong algorithm, it's actually quite a bounded category. So there's a lot that can't be learned. So the way we would apply this is to say, if you want to say that something came into existence plausibly in a random system, then you need the variety of your controller to use a Ross Ashby term from the 1950s, the diversity of system states that it can sense, discriminate and act on. You need that variety to be within the controller you can actually make. So 
What is it that reduces the required or the requisite variety of controllers? It is for the controlled systems to be, for instance, constrained a priori, or to have self-governing mean regression over some of their degrees of freedom, so those don't have to be regulated from the top, or concurrently acting processes so that multiple controllers are acting collaboratively. So where would prior constraints come from in folded matter? Well, some of them can come from the metabolism that we already talked about. So really terrific uh, review paper by Ronells et al. Um, senior author is Lauren Williams, and I'm gonna show you several papers from Lauren's group says that in fact, the monomers that ever form folded structure are a quite remarkable subset. They're <clears throat> the polypeptides, which make beta sheets and alpha helices. They're the polynucleotides that we know of in RNA and DNA. And then they're polysaccharides that make sheet-like starches. What they all have in common is that the medium strength bonds, the hydrogen bonds are present in sign and in number so that when these are arranged in space, every bond that exists to be saturated is saturated by another bond in the complement molecule. So now you have a very complicated mixture of organic synthesis, counting, positioning in space, the number theory of packing things, and the things that really fold have to satisfy all of these at the same time. So there, you have a lot of information in what your synthetic system provides before we've ever talked about how folding happens. When we do talk about how folding happens, that turns out to be a hierarchical entropy rejection funnel in its own little world of rules, kind of like the chain rule in microcosm that we talked about earlier. So these rules are governed largely by the hierarchies of energy scales. If I take monomers and they're free in solution, at some dilution, they won't aggregate because there's too much entropy. If I bond them in a chain with a strong covalent bond, that takes out enough entropy that now the favored state within the molecule can be to aggregate, but not necessarily to make a fold. The next thing that acts slightly lower in energy, but first because it's cooperative, is that the sequences that I make things out of can be more or less soluble. And if they're properly arranged, the insoluble ones in water group together so that they minimize the exclusion energy of water, that will collapse you to what's called a molten globule phase on the way to a fold. And then if the residues are right, the monomers are right, the hydrogen bonds are available, then that molten globule can anneal under the weak force of the hydrogen bonds. And I'm giving you each of these in kilojoules per mole relative to KT. So you can see we're getting down pretty close to the thermal fluctuation energy. And then last of all, so the, the annealing gives you your secondary structures, beta sheets, alpha helices. And then only after all that's done, do the weakest of all, the van der Waals forces, act collectively as a surface to fold you into the tertiary structure that kind of locks it all in place. So now we can ask, how much information do you need to make use of this funnel for folding? Which brings us to 15 years of remarkable work done by Michael Hecht to provide a partial answer to that question. Hecht's system says, look at the uh, arrangement of an alpha helix, this is looked at end on, on the, the spiral, and say what periodicity could I put just hydrophilic hydrophobic residues in so that the hydrophobic ones can all share this kind of folded center and the hydrophilic ones can face out into water and can I make real folds that way? The answer is yes, but the periodicity is this. For beta sheets, it's actually a little bit simpler because residues point up or down and in certain contexts, which I don't have time to go into detail on, with almost complete freedom in which hydrophobic or hydrophilic amino acid it is, as long as you put them in the right place, you can make amyloid-like beta turns. So what Hecht has done is taken the point of view that <clears throat> I now, I can just have broad equivalence classes of what the chemistry of my amino acids is. I have a relatively local condition for what the correlation length is, and out of that I can get folds, but there's still a fair amount of information that he needs to provide because he needs that local condition to be repeated. So it's a kind of a purification argument, a little bit like what we have when we say that we're using the right monomers and not the wrong ones. But you may be able to do better. It's so great to talk to an audience with general relativists in it because I can tell you, and, or I, don't, I don't, don't need to make the argument to you that 
the coordinates that we use may not be the geometry that the system cares about. So my coordinates in space for an alpha helix are the straight Euclidean lines. And in those coordinates, it's 3.6 residues around a turn to make an alpha helix. And that's terrible because it's not an integer and it's not small. And that's why Hecht has this very complicated periodicity that he needs to maintain, like six or more. But if we look at the actual pores of small molecules, this beautiful thing is called a tin barrel. It's an eightfold repeat of alpha helices, red, beta sheet, yellow. And on one of these, I took out the cartoon so I could show you the backbone and then I pull that up here. This little thing is kind of the hydrophobic core of the core. And we find this motif over and over in all the oldest and all the simplest folds. But the world that those carbons live in is a world of tetrahedra bound in chains and that world twists. And in the twist, the natural periodicity in the helix is four. And the natural periodicity of the beta strands that couple to it is two by two. And I don't need to tell you that four is really neat because it's an integer and four is two times two. So all of a sudden the periodicity that worked for beta, if we can coordinate that twice, starts to become periodicity that looks relevant to getting the most molten core for one of the oldest folds. So I think we can argue that finding, making use of folds as a funnel is not vastly improbable in highly random libraries. But what would we need to, to say that this was, that this existed historically or that it did important work that we can take off of the shoulders of a Darwinian loop? Well, we would need evidence placing it before translation, which is when coding is expressed. And we would also need at least a putative mechanism by which folding could actively select sequences and not just passively present them. So that's what I'll show you now. This is the ribosome. This is where everything that's hardest in biology is all brought to the height of tension. This is a significant fraction of a million atoms, RNA, peptides, metals, water, every atom in its place. I wanna argue for you that it's also the place where we have the most empirical evidence for how we maybe untie some of this knot. So, it's been known for several decades, uh, including the work by Tom Stites and collaborators, that the ribosomal peptides, the, the proteins that make up the ribosome, here what we have done is we've ghosted out the RNA so you can't see it, and you're just looking at the proteins in the small subunit and the large subunit that together make a kind of a ratchet that does your translation. And you can see that they're not the same everywhere. On the outside, they have compu complicated globular folds of the kind that we think of as high information, but as you go toward the inside, they're long and stringy. And in fact, they don't, the peptide backbone doesn't even touch itself. It just touches RNA. So there's clearly a change in the character of information. Hyman Hartman and Temple Smith, I don't know if they were the first, but certainly they were early ones to propose that this is not just a gradient in space, but it's also a gradient in time, that the simple was early and the complex came later. The thing that really cracked all of this open was the two Ungstrom crystal structure of the RNA and everything that we could learn from it. So in this wonderful paper, again, by Stites's group, they introduce what they call a minor interactions, which turn out to be important to stabilizing the three-dimensional structure of ribosomes. The way this works is you have a helix like this gray one here, and then you have a new helix that comes in, the orange and the green one. And in the new helix, if you have a stack of three adenosines that can turn out they can pack into the minor groove of the pre-existing helix. And it's a really nice tight thing. So it'll latch this green and yellow thing down onto the gray one. And if I look at the ribosome, these little red tiles, this is all the A minors. So they're everywhere. It's full of them. Five, okay. So this relation is inherently directional. Konstantin Bokov and Sergei Steinberg said, let's make a directed graph of all of the A minor interactions, and let's find out whether it's cyclic or acyclic. And it turns out it is acyclic, which means that there's a center and there's a surround. So in an extraordinary series of papers done within Lauren Williams's group, the first author in this is Anton Petrov, they have gone back and for both the large and the small subunits, they have been able to take the secondary structure and completely decompose it 
into a set of helices that were there before and new helices and other structures that insert into them. And they have shown that in fact, this whole history decomposes into a kind of onion with six phases. And I'll, I'll show you those in the next slide. But the important thing is layer by layer, the onion is a compact structure. It's stabilized by internal interactions and it's suggested to fold autonomously. So moreover, the structural dependency, which is sort of what you need to, to make and fold the thing is recapitulated in the evolutionary branching tree of relatedness. The things that are old are also conserved. The things that are, the things that are deep are also conserved and evidently old. The things that are outer are more variable and evidently newer. This is where they've shown that in fact, the Bokov steinberg dependency can be resolved into six phases. Within a phase, you can't say who comes first and who comes second because they don't depend on each other, they're commutative. But across phases, everything in a later phase must have been preceded by everything in an earlier phase. And here's the, the real remarkable thing. The interface between the large subunit and the small subunit, which allow them to come together to make a ratchet that translates RNA into proteins, that's this yellow layer. These two things first met each other and there was a translation system at the end of the green layer and the beginning of the yellow. So we have all this organization from folding at a time when we know that what it was doing was not translating. If we look at the peptides that I showed you to start, it turns out that their gradient follows the phases of the RNA, it groups with them. And in the deepest, lowest and oldest, they're long and stringy and they get more complex and we would think of as having more information conditions with the beginning of translation beginning to make the complex globular ones possible as stable parts of the lineage. So in all of this literature, these are fine, careful scientists. They know what they mean when they talk about structural dependency. They can back up everything they say about evolutionary relatedness. They typically do not like to commit to a proposed dynamic that would have caused all of this. The reason being many dynamics are confounded and so it would require a big speculative leap to, to propose one and not others. That's why I'm here to talk to you because I'm not as careful. So among the confounded possibilities to show you how bad it gets, could be that everything in the biosphere came from one molecule. We can't rule that out. Or it could be that it's Darwinism all the way down, which is kind of the RNA paradigm that I showed you before. But I think a better prospect for this is that processive folding was a kind of a kinetic filter that distilled sequences in attractors, a little bit like the composomes that Charlie mentioned from Doran Lancet and Daniel Segre. That the early branching effects that we see in the phylogeny have to do with the growth of the basins and that the early large and small subunit functions were kind of just hitchhiking on these things that existed for the sake of folding, not for the sake of some downstream function. So what kind of a mechanism would do something like this? Well, something not very different from precipitation dissolution equilibria. Donna Blackman has done a lot of work on taking a mixed solution of small molecules with different handedness, different chirality, and showing that you can pump out that entropy of mixing just using the binding energy to form crystals that are chiral. Hans Kuhn, way back in the early days of sort of complex system and cybernetics reasoning, was arguing that if you put these binding on binding type transitions in a system that is driven away from equilibrium, you can break symmetry and you can cause the driving to make a version of what today we would call kinetic proofreading. So the conjecture is that in an early world, lineages come up basically only once you can survive and that requires that you fold. So if you have a folded structure with loose ends, things that don't match the fold can be hydrolyzed off and you can try again. But if they fit, then they go in just like fitting into a crystal. And then that becomes part of a stable structure. So folding can take on its own agency. I am at the end of time, but I wanna give you what I think the conjecture for this is, because I think it's really fun. We can ask, was the ribosome actually the first conveyor of lineages? The first thing that we would think of as a genome. We know that folding competence is a precondition to anything because you gotta survive and not get dissolved. 
we know that if you have a strand that's folding complement competent, its dual strand is not generally folding folding competent, which means that that's going to be transient and gone. So the ancestor of the coding strand today has no status in this early world because it's not folding competent. The ribosome thus was not what it is today, a transcribed copy of a hereditary signal. Rather, it was the carrier of heredity. And the only thing that allowed its complement strand to ever become what we think of as the coding part of genome was in fact the emergence of translation that was not created by that genome. So our summary, um, minimizing information requirements is a real principle that we can get from counting and that transcends many mechanisms and our lack of knowledge of them. The informations that we're talking about depend on the materials we're talking about and their state spaces so we can make specific hypotheses. I will argue there should be key irreplaceable transitions that are the information gateways, and we can reason about these from laws. And in particular, that there are three of them in this talk, metabolism, folded matter, coded matter, in that order. And if you think that this is a plausible argument, I think it entails that the ribosome is our best candidate for the first genome. So, I want to acknowledge uh, many people who have worked very hard to help me learn to think about this stuff, though anything nutty I say is my fault and not theirs, especially Anton Petrov, who's given me extraordinary time, but the entire Williams group and all of my collaborators here and collaborators at LC who are also experts in folding and random libraries, the institutions that have kept me alive materially and cognitively, and these are better versions of the citations. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Eric. That was really fascinating. So do we have questions from the room? Yes. Microphone is on its way. I didn't see who was first, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you talked about the ribosome being the first genome or something. And then, at the, but earlier you said that there, the two pieces, the large, the LSU and the, the small unit um, had features that you said was not meant for translation, as if you could figure out what it was doing before they became, what these two pieces were doing before they became part of the ribosome. What, what are the speculations about what that functionality was? That's important if you want to say that it was the first genome. I, I, I assume you mean that the, not the ribosome, but the most fundamental conserved parts of each of those subunits are what was there before the ribosome. And, and, and after it became a translation apparatus too, through that whole transition. But yeah, terrific question. Um, it is believed by a great many people that what the large subunit was, was a general purpose condensation catalyst. Polyesters, polypeptides, ester amide exchange, these kinds of chemistry that are ubiquitous in the deepest and oldest parts of everything having to do with nucleotide and polymer formation. The small subunit <clears throat> seems to be believed to be related to RNA coordination, possibly helping template-directed ligation. That seems to be more open. The two are rather different in their architecture, in their RNA structure, their domain structure, and their relation to peptides. There is an interesting thing that for the sake of time, I skipped over in the slide. The structural center in the 2014 paper by Petrov et al is not the same as what we think of as the functional center in either the large or the small subunit. In the large subunit, it's the peptidal transfer center. I forget what it's called in the small. Um, they choose their phases to start with the functional center. I'm curious whether we can revisit that and find out whether the structural center could be a good place to start. And we see even those earliest functions as hitchhikers in a kind of a hailstone world all open, all of this needs to be turned into proper hypotheses and then tested through a combination of bioinformatics and actual synthesis. Thank you. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we don't have time for more questions now, but you're of course free to discuss further over lunch and the rest of the conference. So let's thank the speakers again for these great talks that we've had this session.